Did you hear something? Shh, keep it down, keep it down. The enemy is here! Sound the alarm! Shoot the crew! Everyone, to the doors, quickly! So let's get started with the build. Like any slice and slot build, I start by taking my 100mm high by 10mm thick piece of XPS foam and I score it up using our Scorematic 10,000. With that done, I cut the pieces down to 120mm wide strips and I put the foam back into the Scorematic 10,000. Now, I use a second piece of foam to align it to that 10 mil thickness. That's something about this system that I guess I don't really stress enough is everything's designed to make sure that you don't have to measure things with a ruler. It all works off increments of 10 mil or 5 mil. So if you've got a piece of 10 mil thick, that then becomes a kind of measuring jig uh, in and of itself. Once I have that aligned, I come across and I cut out every second brick using a hot wire cutter. Now I've marked here with a pen just to make sure that I don't forget which ones I'm supposed to be cutting. Because the Scorematic 10,000 template gives you a symmetrical stone pattern, this will work regardless of the orientation. Once I've got all of my corner pieces cut out, I'm doing a dry test fit just to make sure that everything aligns. And there you go, it's a perfect corner every time. Now that I've got my corners cut in, I'm just gonna quickly come in and cut in the brickwork using our traditional method of marking everything out with a pencil, coming back in and etching with our hobby knife, and then making sure that we depress those lines again with the pencil. If you want a masterclass on how I approach my stone carving, drop it in the comments below and I'll do a, a quick little expose. As always, we texture the foam with an aluminium ball and I come in with my knife blade case and just depress some of those individual stones to give it a little bit more textured variation. Now at this point, I realized that the tower was only 100 mil high and 120 mil wide, so it was feeling a bit short and fat. So to combat that, I cut up an extra two sheets, as you can see here, and I'm cutting these in half. So these will again go together perfectly because that Scoromatic 10,000 gives us a symmetrical brick pattern. So by cutting it in half, it's still gonna work with that corner jig. Now I can place that extra set on top and I can carve in the stonework and stick all of this together. I'm using PVA glue to stick all of this down and I'll reinforce it with some bamboo skewers as well. This will make sure that everything's really held together. And again, I just repeat the process gluing down that half height section on top. It doesn't matter if this doesn't perfectly align because you'll just get one row of stonework which is slightly recessed or kind of jutting out. And that adds a little bit more character to the stonework as well. So don't be afraid if things don't perfectly align. With the base tower glued and dried, I'm gonna work on the floor. Now I'm using five mil thick XPS foam here and I've cut it so that it's just a little bit larger than the width of the stone tower. That way we get a nice kind of overhang. That allows us to get a little bit more articulation. Any way that you can break up large flat pieces of stonework will help to kind of sell the detail and believability of a piece. So. I'm just carving in some flagstones here to that floor piece and I'll glue that on using my hot glue gun. I kind of oscillate between PVA and hot glue depending on how important it is to hold a piece down 
versus how quickly I want to work. I know that I'm going to be reinforcing this join with more bamboo skewers in the next section. So this is just about getting everything glued down fast. I noticed here that the five mil thick wasn't very sturdy. So I did end up going in and adding in some supports underneath the floor as well, just to make sure that that was really sturdy for gaming purposes. Now I'm working on the upper walls and you'll notice here, I've got some 3D printed elements. These are all failed prints or prints that I wasn't happy with sending out to Kickstarter backers that did the physical pledges. So uh, I thought I'd save all of these and I've chopped them all up. It's super easy to chop them up with a pair of clippers. I've got a couple of doorway arches there to kind of define the entrances to the gatehouse as well as a failed print on a window. I wanted a window at the front face of that tower. And I've really tried to make sure that this top section of the tower is as kind of crumbled down as possible. To glue the 3D prints in place, I'm using a two-part epoxy. I haven't come across any other glue that really uh, sticks between foam and 3D prints. If you've come across anything that works well to glue foam and prints together, let me know in the comments down below. With the 3D prints now dry and attached, I'm just going to come back and glue these walls to the top. So same thing again, using PVA glue, I'm also going to use bamboo skewers to make sure that they're really firmly attached to the base tower as well. And that again, reinforces the floor section and really ties everything in. So this is gonna be a really sturdy construction by the end of it. I wasn't happy with the clear junction between the foam and the 3D print. So I wanted to conceal this just with a 50-50 mix of green stuff and milliput. You don't have to do this, but I did feel like it was a little bit immersion breaking. So I wanted to come in and just see if I could sculpt the top of these stone elements to make sure it kind of felt a little bit more integrated and seamless. This is a really simple process. If you're not very skilled at uh, sculpting like myself, it's a good way to get some practice in. Um, I just use a single sculpting tool and depress the miller part in to make it look a little bit like shattered stonework. It's pretty straightforward working backwards and forwards with the, the, the two ends of the sculpting tool. And I ended up actually smashing it a little bit with that aluminium foil bowl that I used to texture the foam as well to kind of tie it in. And this is the end result here. Once it's all painted, it'll look like a seamless singular piece, which will be a much better result. Now we've got one tower, but we need two. And here we go, two towers ready to go. Now all we need is the actual gate that connects these two. So I'm gonna use my extra large cutting jig and cut out the door that will slot into this piece. Again, I'm matching the height of the tower and I've pre-cut some lovely Minas Tirith style battlements uh, here. Now here's the big reveal, the openable gates. Now I had intended for this video to drop about six months ago, but uh, Kickstarter got too busy and so here we are. When I'm ready, I glue everything down using some hot glue and uh, I place it on the cutting mat there so that it stays flush. Same thing again for these battlements, they all get glued down with hot glue. Now, I'll just quickly show you the gate mechanism. So you can see there, I'm just inserting a one mil a paper clip into that hinge to secure it in place. I've already gone through and done that for the rest of them. Now here's a cool thing about Slice and Slot. I kind of changed my mind. I wanted to add in a door to the bottom of the back of this tower for the gatehouse. It's super simple to do even after I've finished carving everything. Just use that small jig to place in that door and voila, there you go. Now I am ready to attach everything to the base. 
The baseboard, as usual, I'm using PVC foam board uh, or Sintra or sign writing board, depending on where you are in the world. It's a great material because unlike MDF, you can soak it in glue and it won't warp or bend in any way. It's dimensionally stable. I'm using hot glue here to glue all of the pieces down. Uh, that is really just a, a case of speed and I know that I'm going to do a lot of PVA gluing for the ground cover which will help to reinforce the joins between uh, these pieces and that baseboard down the line. So there we go, most of the build is complete. Now all we need to do is the walkway that connects the two stone towers. For that, I want to have a really ruined kind of look. So I'm using again that extra large uh, cutting jig and I'm gonna cut out some kind of half ruined arches to give the impression that this used to be a fully connected stone piece, but now it's a little bit more ruined. You can see here one of these other failed prints and I'll show you how easy it is to cut it up just along the stone line, you use a pair of clippers, and because the resin's pretty brittle, it just snaps off, uh, usually perfectly, along that line. Sometimes you have to tidy it up a little bit, but it's a very straightforward process. So again, never throw away a failed print. You can always use uh, these elements in some kind of build. Again, I'm using the epoxy resin to glue that all in place. Once I've got that stonework in place, I'm gonna come in and do some flagstones. Now, I wanna have a mix of flagstones, but also kind of the timber supports that sit underneath that. For the timber, I'm using these small sized popsicle sticks. I'm just gonna take my hobby knife and rough up the edges. This will help when we get to the painting stage. It'll help sell them as kind of a, a weathered timber. I'm also using some balsa wood for the edge beams, just to give a bit of variance in terms of the thickness of the pieces to kind of sell it as a real structural element. I use a bit of blue masking tape here to provide a stable base to align all of my timber planks. That really helps to make sure that everything uh, is held in place whilst I'm gluing the pieces. This is a super simple technique to make sure that things don't move around because you want to use some PVA glue to make sure that this is all uh, really strong. Important to come through and constantly kind of dry fit and test that things are actually going to fit. It doesn't need to fit perfectly. This is a ruined gatehouse after all, but it does need to at least uh, you know vaguely go together. So with my wooden floor all finished and vaguely dry, I come along with hot gun to secure this one in place. Sometimes I use a hot glue when there's kind of a big gap and I use the hot glue to fill that gap to make sure that there's actually a connection point uh, between the two materials. In this case, there was a little bit of a gap. Um, so that's why I'm using that in there. Also, I wanted it to stick pretty quickly. Um, so hot glue is the go there. Then over the top, I'm just gluing on those uh, ruined flagstones. And this gives me a really nice uh, kind of broken down look to the, the piece. It's important when you're making these pieces that you're thinking about the narrative. So this was kind of a hasty repair. Perhaps the stonemasons weren't on hand to, to repair the gatehouse. And so they had to make do with some rickety timber instead. For the ground cover, I wanted to have some cobblestones, but I didn't want the whole area cobbled. Uh, I just wanted it in places. So I'm using this air drying clay and a roller from Green Stuff World to uh, press out that pattern. And we'll blend any of these um, edges with the flocking in the next stage. Now that that's done, we're ready to coat the whole model in our usual mix of brown, black, and Mod Podge. I water this down a little bit just so that I can make sure it gets into all of the nooks and crannies and I give a full coat to all of the foam. I was a little bit worried about using that Mod Podge mix on the gate itself, especially with those hinges. I didn't want to glue them shut so that they wouldn't uh, move. So I have opted to come in with my airbrush 
and just prime that one with a black primer, which has worked really well. The hinges still work after this. I had a little bit of extra black paint in the cup, so I've just gone in and done some pre-shading uh, and also just tried to break up a little bit of that monotonous brown to give a little bit more subtle texture for the following paint phases. At this point, I realized everything was looking a little bit too clean for a ruin. So I did a mix of my homemade modeling compound, which is, you know, one part paper pulp to two parts plaster, roughly mixed with some water to get a cottage cheese like consistency. This is always a bit of a balancing act. You want to sell the fact that this is a ruined gatehouse, but you also want to make it as playable as possible. So we're being pretty sparing. If we were doing this realistically, there'd probably be a lot more rubble surrounding this piece but we're just trying to sell the idea that there is kind of rubble that has fallen down so once that modeling compound has set up a little bit i depress in these uh, textured little individual foam bricks to really sell that idea that this is the the rubble once that's done it is now on to the final phase of the painting so i'm coming back in with my airbrush and just kind of zenithal highlighting the whole piece, spraying from above wherever I can uh, amid grey. And this goes over the top of everywhere. I'm not worried about hitting the wood as well because we'll come back with a contrast paint later to finish that one up. Now I was going to come in with a white zenithal over the top of this, but my airbrush needle nozzle snapped. So... Fool of a took. So instead, I come back in with my big makeup brush and I've mixed up a kind of warmish, lighter gray. I'm, I'm mixing in some beige into this to give it a bit of a warm tone, which links it back with the brown undercoat. I'm coming over with the big makeup brush over these big areas, and then I'll switch over to a smaller brush where I need to get into some of those details. Important to note that foam and 3D prints take paint kind of differently. So the foam gets almost an overbrush, and I only hit those 3D prints once most of the paint has actually come off the brush because the 3D prints um, take that paint a lot easier I find than the the foam does. Then it's on to the timber. I'm using a wildwood contrast paint that is watered down a little bit to, to make sure it's a little less dark and a little bit more weathered and I hit this on all of the timber sections, the doors and that timber walkway as well. Now we come to my favorite phase, the weathering phase. Now I got a replacement needle nozzle for my airbrush so that I could specifically do this. In the cup, I have a mix of burnt umber, burnt sienna, a green ink, and a little bit of black. And I've just mixed that to the desirable kind of grimy color. I'm working this into the base of the tower and anywhere in the corners where you would get that grime buildup. Again, where you've got the uh, stonework protruding at the floor level, that's a perfect place to work on some uh, grime and drip lines, which really sell this aging effect. Also inside the actual tower itself is a really good place, anywhere where there's going to be grime buildup. Then I decided to pick out some individual bricks. This technique actually worked a real treat. Anywhere where I had depressed the stonework using the cutting blade piece, I hit it with this kind of darker mix and it really helped to sell the depth in that stonework and, and grime it up a little bit more. So I just worked my way around all of the tower and the gatehouse, making sure that all of that is hit with this grimy mix. With all the weathering done, I come back in and I just add some quick highlights onto the timber to make it look a little bit more aged. Uh, and once that's done, I come back with some dark metallic. I think this is Vallejo, their gunmetal airbrush range, which is a beautiful dark steel, which is perfect for all of the ironwork, the banding across the gate. So I do this for the gatehouse and also all of the uh, smaller doors on the rear of the gatehouse too. With that done, the only thing left to do is get flocking. So here I'm trying a slightly different technique. I'm gonna lay down all of my base dirt 
first. And this is a blend of Geek Gaming Scenic's uh, New Zealand Patchy Plains and my own home mix of Coffee Grounds, Dirt from the Garden and Brown uh, Tile Grout. I'm layering these on top of one another back and forth to give it a really kind of patchy and integrated look. And I'm not too worried if I get some on the stone cobbles as well, because that kind of sells the idea that it's all kind of sunken into the ground. Once that's dry, I'll add in my clump foliage and I'm doing that at this stage before I do the rest of the foam flocking so that I can really uh, soak all of this in PVA and uh, make sure that it's really stuck down. You can see here I'm working backwards and forwards with some watered down PVA and then spraying it with isopropyl to make sure that all of that glue uh, covers nicely and soaks all the way through the foam to make it rock hard. This isn't going anywhere. Once that's done, I come back in with some more foam flocks over the top. I'm not going to soak these as much with PVA because I find that sometimes it's, uh, it can kind of leave a bit of a shiny look to it and I really don't like that vibe. So. I'm using a light yellowish foam flock and then a mid green and I've also got this blend of birch seeds and reindeer moss that I've uh, cut up really finely to simulate some leaf scatter. Uh, and that, that gives me a really nice varied autumnal kind of ground cover look that I really love for Arnor ruins. The last thing, and this is a new experiment for me, was to uh, simulate some moss and I'm using some light green foam flock from Geek Gaming. The nice thing about the Geek Gaming range is that the foam isn't color fast. Uh, and this means that you can kind of blend out the edges uh, of this when you're using it as a uh, kind of a moldy, mossy look. And this, when it looks wet, uh, is kind of a bit scary. You, you kind of think that this is gonna be a terrible mistake, but as it dries, it tones down and it actually sells that idea of uh, moss really well. The only thing left to do now that everything's dry is come in and put a few little tufts here and there, uh, and that's it, we're ready. The only thing left to do now is give you the big reveal. So that's it guys, this is my beautiful ruined gatehouse of Fornost ready for the battlefield. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Hit that subscribe and like button if you want to see more content. I'm thinking about maybe doing a whole Arnor series of terrain, diving back into some old source books. Let me know if you're keen to see more of that in the comments down below. Until next time though, have fun hobbying.